Hello, and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. As we're moving on to week 2, where we are going to be talking about storage models and file systems, I thought it might be useful to start out with a quick exercise to warm up. For this, we're going to try to follow every sysadmin's favorite train of thought. Hmm, I wonder what happens if… I recommend that you use this video to follow along and run the same commands, but also to then think beyond just what you've seen and explore more. So make sure to open the terminal and play along, pausing the video as we run through this episode of Full House entitled No Space Left on Device. Let's begin by starting a new screen session. If you're not familiar with screen or with tmux, I recommend that you check out the tooltip video I've linked from the course website. But let's continue. We log into the Linux lab and take a look at how much disk space we have on the local file system. Looks like we have plenty of space, 11 gigs. Let's create a large file to use up all that disk space using the dd command shown here. This is going to take a few seconds, but eventually you're going to run out of space. The file we created is 11 gig large, so not surprisingly our file system is now full, preventing us from writing any data or creating any new files. But this can have other negative side effects that may be quite a bit less obvious. With the file system now completely full, let's try to log in again. Again we run SSH and… Uh oh, we get some error messages. But we're still logged in, aren't we? Let's try to run a few commands. Um, what? Nothing's working. Let's check what's going on in the other shell where we were logged in in the beginning. First, let's take a look at the dev standard in, dev standard out, and dev standard er devices. They all point into the procfs, a pseudo file system representing file descriptors. Now, let's see what processes we're running. Well, this shell appears to be process ID 2115. The other shell running must then be the one that's so broken, pit 2157. So we can look at the file descriptors associated with that pit under PROC 2157FD. Here we find a few open file descriptors, with file descriptor 0 and 2, standard in and standard er, pointing to the pseudo terminal PTS 36, but we notice the absence of a file descriptor 1, standard out. This explains why the commands we ran didn't produce any output. Standard out was apparently closed. As it turns out, my login shell, ksh, the so called corn shell, tries to open a few files in redirect.io when you log in, but if the file system is full, it can't do that and we end up in an impressively busted state. So let's try another shell instead. The ssh command lets you specify a command to run when you connect, so let's run bash. Huh, now what? No error. Are we logged in? Turns out we are. When we run a command directly via SSH, then we don't get a pseudo terminal allocated, but the command bash in this case is still connected to standard in and standard out of the SSH command. So we can run commands. Look, there's that big file we created. But we'd be more comfortable having a normal shell when we log in. So Let's ask SSH to allocate a pseudo terminal for us by specifying the dash T flag. There, that looks more normal, doesn't it? So apparently, bash has no problem with a full file system at login time. And we can now remove that big file that we created that's using up all the disk space and caused the problems. Okay. Now with that cleaned up, we can exit here. Now that the disk space that was taken up by the file tempig has been made available again, we can check in our connection in the broken shell, which still remains broken, because just by removing the file does not miraculously allocate a proper file descriptor for the shell we have sitting here. So let's exit that shell and reconnect. 
There, everything's perfectly normal again. Now if you try to recreate this scenario, please do make sure to remove any large files you create so that the system does not get negatively impacted by you playing around with this exercise. You will likely see slightly different behavior depending on whether you have bash as your login shell, but I specifically wanted to illustrate that the act of filling up the file system can have an effect on seemingly unrelated processes with possibly confusing or inconsistent results. One user might complain, while another user might not notice anything odd right away. Alright, so we've seen what happens when we fill up all our disk space with one giant file. Let's try something else. Again, let's take a look at how much disk space we have available here. And let's create a directory under slash temp and specify a path name for a large file we want to work with. If we look at the output of the df command, we can extract exactly how much disk space is available from the fourth field. There. Now we'll use the truncate command to create a file of a specific size. Specifically, we'll try to create a file that's many times larger than the available disk space. So we copy this command here and append a few zeros. There. Wait, what? We were able to create a file that's thousands times larger than the available disk space? How did that work? Look at the size of this file. It's impossible. And df even tells her that we have plenty of room to spare. This makes no sense. What does du tell us about this file? Okay, du tells us this file uses zero blocks. What does stat say? Stat shows us the file size as being really large, but still using zero blocks. So what on earth is going on here? The file we created clearly appears to both have a huge size and use no disk space. This is because it was created by simply setting the file size, but not by writing any data to it. It's a so-called sparse file. Not all file systems support sparse files, but this one does. What happens when you copy this file? Okay, that seems to work. Now we have two of these weirdo files here. Both seemingly huge and using no disk space. This is because the cp command is smart. It detects that this is a sparse file and then creates a true copy of this file. But if we try to read the file using cat and then redirect the output to another file, this suddenly takes a really long time and eventually we get back the error that we're out of disk space. And now look at these two files. The second file now uses lots of blocks on disk, so many that it filled up the file system. This is because when the kernel tries to read a sparse file, it notices that there's no data there, so it supplies null bytes instead, and the reading process will then see null bytes, which in this case it writes out to the second file. Weird, huh? As you can tell, our disk is now actually full again, and only after we remove the files do we get back our disk space. So this is an illustration of surprising behavior that may depend on the file system in question. If you run these commands in some other operating system or using a different file system, you may get a different result. But alright, let's move on. We've now seen how our system behaves if you create really large files. When you actually write data, it obviously uses up the disk space. But you're also able to create a file that looks like it's huge but doesn't take up disk space. But what happens if instead of creating one huge file, you create lots and lots of small files? Let's give it a try. Here we use the df-i command to inspect the inode usage of the file system. We'll go into much more detail in a future video segment about what exactly an inode is, but for now suffice it to say that each file is associated with an inode. So in this case we have 923,261 available free inodes. 
if we create a directory, then we've used up one inode. And if we create one file, then we've used up another inode. Likewise, if we remove the file, then we get back the inode. And likewise for the directory. Makes sense. So now let's see what happens if we use up all of our inodes. For that, we need to create 923,261 files. That's going to be tedious if we run individual commands. So I wrote a simple program to create new files for us. You can fetch it from our course website. And it looks like so. We create a directory, and then we loop forever, creating new files in that directory until we fail. Let's compile and run this program. Okay, so after some time, the program will fail as we expect. It reports that it has created 923,260 files, plus that one directory under which it created the files. Note the error message, no space left on device. Sounds like full house, I mean disk full. Let's take a look at the size of the directory. Oops, wrong path. Over here, in slash temp. There, this directory is pretty large. Let's look at the files we created in there. Notice how even running ls on it takes a long time? That's because the directory is so large. Let's confirm how many files are found in the directory. Yep, 923,260 files. So now let's try to create a new file. Nope, no can do, no spice left on device but I can move a file from the directory into another one. This is because moving a file does not create a new file. Again, we'll get into the details of that in a future video. But so the file we created is zero bytes in size, and so are the other 923,259 files. But how can we be out of disk space then? Didn't we have 11 gigs of space available? Well, it turns out that we aren't out of disk space we actually can still write data to the disk. So long as we write it to an existing file. We are out of inodes, meaning we can't create new files, but we can certainly still have disk space available, as shown here. In fact, we can easily write a gigabyte of data to the existing file. See? No problem. But let's clean up and remove the almost 1 million files we created here. Note again that this takes quite some time. Let's suspend the process for a second and check if we've made any progress. Yep, looks like we've freed up almost 200,000 inodes already. Let's continue. Oh, and let's also take a look at the directory size while we're removing all those files. Huh, look at that. Same size as when it contained almost a million files. Alright, more on that later. Let's continue for now. 
There we go. Back to where we started. All right. Did you run the same examples? Did you play around with what happens when we use up disk space or inodes? Here are the key things this warm-up exercise was intended to illustrate. 1. Running out of disk space can lead to odd side effects. We saw that when some users were unable to log into the system because the disk was full, but other users had no problem. 2. File sizes are not always what they seem to be. There's a difference between a file size and how many blocks of disk space a file uses, and this difference can be significant depending on the file and file system. 3. Error messages aren't always what they seem to be. When we ran out of inodes, the error message was no space left on device, but that's misleading. If you saw this error message and then ran df, it would have shown you many gigabytes of free disk space. It's important to know the different error scenarios that could lead to this error message when you're troubleshooting your system. And 4, and this is something we'll get back to time and time again, all resources are finite. It may seem that nowadays we have a lot of disk space, but if it's possible to exhaust it, some process somehow will. A common Unix file system may seem to have near infinite number of files it can store, but the file system is restricted by the number of available inodes, and those can be used up too. We'll see many other examples throughout the semester. We'll also revisit a lot of what we touched upon here in the next couple of videos, but I hope that this warm-up exercise helped to get you thinking about file systems and the resources we're managing in this fashion. Make sure to check out links in the slides and read up on the suggested reading material. Next time we'll talk about storage models, and I hope that you will keep the limitations we've seen here in the back of your mind when we do. Until then, thanks for watching. Cheers!